back at great moments in racing. Germany, 1949. Daring young cyclists roar through the Rhine Valley, hitting speeds well over 63 miles per hour. Each contestant is timed one by one after a flying start until they reach the finish rock at the end of the course. 1993. The World Trade Center was bombed. As was a quasi-religious community in Waco, Texas, in a manner of speaking. The Rodney King trial turned South LA into a similar war zone. The youth of America has always felt disenfranchised by the establishment. The grunge music movement emerging from Seattle was huge. Come as you are. On January 20th, Bill Clinton was sworn in as the President of the United States. Three days later, on January 23rd, 1993, the shape of Supercross to come changed in one definitive moment. It's going to be Ian Bradshaw, and he'll do the same thing. The gate is down. The charge is on. The Up again. So too is Jeremy McGrath. He's narrowed that margin down on the senior member of the team, Jeff Stan. Whoa! Shoots to the inside. McGrath makes the pass. Makes it look easy. I was about to cut in on you and say, I don't think, Dave, you'll see McGrath find a pass stand. He's the rookie, the young guy on Team Honda, and you don't do that to the national champ. Pick Anaheim Stadium, which to win their first ever Supercross main event. How many pass champions did I count in there? Uh, more than one. <laughs> McGrath, wave into the crowd, obviously comes from good stock here, following a tradition of new stars born in Anaheim. He is about to take the checkered flag. He passed Jeff Stanton and simply ran away from him. We kept waiting for Stanton to mount the counterattack that never came. And so the rookie will win the first one by a big margin. Yeah, my apologies to Jeremy and his entire family and all of his followers. I really thought, Dave, <laughs> that he was going to slack it off there, but uh, it's not happening. It took only three years for McGrath to bolt past both Rick Johnson and Bob Hammett, become the winningest Supercross racer of all time, before he was even a third of the way into his career. As the next four years passed, he would own every record, the most championships in a row, and the most championships period. Supercross was Jeremy's world, and the others were just racing in it. McGrath's seemingly unreachable records would continue to grow for a second four years. But in 2001, the sport again changed in a singular moment. Some eight years after McGrath had scored his first Supercross win, the 2001 Supercross series began with Jeremy splitting wins with upstart Ricky Carmichael. Then, in his third season of Supercross, after two troubled campaigns in which he crashed more often than he won, McGrath won the Anaheim Open and the second Anaheim, and it seemed that all systems were normal. But then Carmichael, who had won the second and fourth rounds, San Diego and Phoenix, squared off with the seven-time defending champion in Anaheim for a third time. Despite getting poorly, Carmichael would catch and go past the king. That pass marked the passing of the torch. Carmichael would win the next 13 races on his way to the first of five Supercross titles. Jeremy McGrath would never win again. It's a little harder to put a definitive stamp on the timeline of the 2024 season. First triple crown, Chet had it in the bag, then screwed the pooch at the very end of the third race. Well, they said, Chet has never done well at triple crowns. A few weeks later, 
perfect. Stalking and then outgunning Ken Roxon, who had won four of the last five Indianapolis races. You see it, and you got it. There it is, Chip Lawrence to the lead. Now it's come together. And Lawrence finally locks it down. Roxon has a different jump line. Is that the moment? Split by thirds? Well, no, because the sum total of the Triple Crown sweep is Jet's fifth win of the season. We can say that by passing Ken three times in as many Triple Crown races, Jet does join Roxon, who is the only rider to sweep a Triple Crown in the Premier class. The culmination of continued elevation. With Jeremy, there was that one remarkable moment. With Ricky, there was that one singular moment. With Jet, it's more the culmination of many moments. But the results and perception are nonetheless similar and equally undeniable. Just as only Jeremy could beat Jeremy in his era, We've now entered the era of Jet Lawrence. Supercross Championships history in Seattle dates back 42 years, with a total of 46 races across two different stadiums. In 1979, Seattle became the third city in Supercross history to host doubleheaders, doing so until 1989. As a result, the Old Kingdom was home to 33 races over the course of 22 seasons, the fourth most of any stadium in history. The Seattle Kingdom, officially King County Stadium, was a multi-purpose stadium located in the Industrial District. In 1968, King County voters approved the issue of $40 million in municipal bonds to construct the stadium. Ironically, the Dome Stadium was thought to be a must because of Seattle's frequent rain. Construction began in 1972, and the stadium opened in 1976 as the home of the Seattle Seahawks. Owned and operated by King County, the stadium also served as the home of the Seattle Mariners in baseball and the NBA Supersonics. But enough of this stick and ball nonsense. The first Supercross race held in Seattle was on February 18, 1978, opening that year's series. Jimmy Ellis earned his final career win riding a Honda, which was his lone win aboard a brand other than the Can-Am. Races were held in the Kingdom for the next 12 years. Yamaha's Mike Bell won the first of two Seattle races in 1979 teammate and eventual series champion Bob Hurricane Hanna winning the second. Bell would return the following year and sweep both Kingdom races. Hanna swept the Seattle doubleheader in 1983, this time aboard a Honda. Rick Johnson is the proverbial king of Seattle, winning seven races over six seasons of doubleheaders, including his first crew win in 1984. He also posted a pair of doubleheader sweeps in 1987 and 89, and won four straight races from 1986 through 1988. 
Ron Lachine took three of his career wins in Seattle. Seattle area native Larry Ward won just three Supercross main events in his career, but he bookended those wins at his home race nine years apart, winning his first in 1990 and his final in 1999, which was also the final race held inside the kingdom. Ward's win in 1990 came at the culmination of a bare knuckle bar banging brawl with Jeff Chicken and Cassie Bush. March 26, 2000, the Kingdome was demolished by implosion. Seahawks' new stadium, now known as Lumen Field, was built on the site and opened in 2002. King County finally paid off the bonds used to build and repair the Kingdome in 2015, 15 years after its demolition. Following a hiatus from 2000 to 2004, Supercross returned to Seattle in 2005 at its current home, Century Link Field, an open-air stadium that's not particularly well-suited to hosting Supercross races in the springtime. Four-time champion and Washington State native Ryan Villapoto earned his first of 41 career 450 Supercross wins at Century Link Field in 2009 in front of the hometown crowd. He would win again in Seattle in 2014, on his way to wrapping up his fourth straight Supercross Championship in his final U.S. season. Honda mounted Kevin Windham took the penultimate Supercross victory of his career at Seattle in 2010, also winning the very next race and the last of his career a week later in Salt Lake City. Eli Tomac won the Seattle round in 2018, 2022, and again last year, in the race that tied him with James Stewart for second place on the all-times win list with 50. He would, of course, win at least one more. But guess who won the 250 class that same night? So, here we are. Most of us sick of muddy, soft, and rutted tracks. And some hoping that somehow, the next stop is the race that resets the championship. 
Coming into the Seattle race one year ago, three riders were locked in a tight battle, with just 17 points separating the leader Cooper Webb from third place Chase Sexton. Then second in the points, Eli Tomac took his third Seattle win. Just over a month later, he would tear his Achilles. Just as there's always a minute in time, when everything changes, so too can a lot happen in a single year. It took McGrath only nine races to get his first win. Carmichael's first win came in his 21st attempt, and that was at Daytona. Ricky wouldn't win another Supercross race, nor vie for the title, until the season after that, his third in the class. Jet Lawrence not only won his very first Premier Class Supercross race, he's now won 5 out of 10. Lawrence has also won the last 5 championships he's competed in a row. Now 21 up on two-time champion Cooper Webb, and more than a race up on the field. Jet is 25 points clear of the defending Supercross champion Sexton. 35 up on Kenny, and 36 ahead of Tomat. The writing is on the wall, in 30-foot letters, for the timeline of Supercross to come. And hey, if you liked this video, don't just like this video, although I'd appreciate that. Also hit the subscribe button, that'd be great. Meanwhile, thanks for watching this.